This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. We have a very special consensus statement featured in Heart Rhythm Journal in September issue. And to talk about this huge, huge document and this important update, we've got three of the authors, three amongst 42 of this incredible work, um, led by ERA with Stelios Jace. Welcome, Stelios. Thank you for having us. Our leader and an and ERA spokesperson. And then we have Ed Gerstenfeld and Elaine Wan from, from the United States and representing Heart Rhythm Society. Thank you for joining us, Ed and Elaine. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. Great to be here. And this is obviously in collaboration with APHRS, LAHRS. Someone take us through where we were in the prior statements and what sort of effort this required to get this one off the ground. So let me start. Uh, thank you for having us. It was uh, a really huge effort and a challenging task. And I want to thank uh, uh, publicly all the 40, 44, it was 44 members, Rod, not 42. And uh, they did a huge effort. And uh, this scientific initiative uh, was uh, performed in collaboration with uh, these uh, four societies, ERA, HRS, APHRS, and LAHRS. And this was fueled by the need that we had so many new technological evidence, tools, scientific evidence, tested strategies that we needed a, a new consensus to shape a framework for the selection and management of patients undergoing catheter or surgical AF ablation. So this was an iteration of the 2017 uh, uh, consensus statement, and it was really a huge effort. And Ed, when we're looking at general statements and guidelines, there's a difference of level of evidence. We're used to seeing A, B, C. What we're seeing here makes it even easier for the reader. It's to do, and then it's actually telling you the exact type of evidence. Maybe you can just take us through that nomenclature. Yeah, thanks, Rod. Um, and part of the reason for that is that technically this is a consensus statement as opposed to a guideline document. So that's why the societies felt that we couldn't use the class one, two, three uh, nomenclature. But as you said, I think it is in a sense for the to do, it, you know, more straightforward where to do is recommended, may be appropriate, would be would have been sort of a 2A type ca category. Uncertain means there's some controversy and then the not to do, and then the level of evidence. Personally, I push back against meta. Meta means multiple randomized trials or meta-analyses. I wasn't a fan of having meta-analyses being the highest standard, but that means multiple trials. You know, random rand mean one high quality trial, observational studies, and then opinion. So um, hopefully if that's clear, it, it, it argues, you know, what the, the strength of the recommendation is and the supporting evidence. Excellent. And maybe Dr. Wan can take us through this really key schematic that really is a nice flow chart talking about how to consider the management of a patient with atrial fibrillation. And I even saw that there was more refinements about early paroxysmal, less than 24 hours, early persistent, less than three months, you know, as we have this traditional three Ps. Elaine, maybe you can take us through uh, this important chart. Right, great. First of all, I just wanted to um, say thanks again to Stelios and all the co-authors uh, for really this Herculean effort to uh, undergo this document. And I think this is a wonderful and uh, simple diagram to go through, of course, patients with proxismal or persistent atrial fibrillation. And if they're symptomatic, really, if they're resistant or intolerant to anti anti um, antiarrhythmics, that catheter ablation is beneficial and um, it advise it's a possible um option for the patient um, and whether or not a first line treatment catheter ablation is also possibility for this patient. Um, and for persistent AF, if they're symptomatic, definitely catheter ablation is beneficial and advisable. And then there could be some discussion about whether or not if the patient is needing to undergo surgery if hybrid ablation is also reasonable. Uh, but I thought that this was a very good way to simplify the approach to patients that we have with atrial fibrillation. Excellent. And, and so much of this is based on a lot of the new work about decreasing progression, our improved outcomes in paroxysmal patients. And that's why we're seeing the difference between beneficial versus reasonable. Is that right? Right. I think that this adds to um, all the um, studies I've done since the 
previous consensus we into now, which really shows that um, targeting or, or inhibiting the further progression of atrial fibrillation, as well as the electrophysiological um, progression and anatomical changes once the heart develops atrial fibrillation, that earlier um, targeting with ablation therapy is beneficial for our patients. And the other thing just to add, I think it's a great summary, is, you know, one of the debates was should we, since those studies you mentioned, Rod, a lot of them were cryoballoon, you know, should this recommendation be energy specific? But I think everyone felt based on obviously fire and ice, comparative studies, that it shouldn't be based, you know, on, on energy source. That's whatever the operator uses. It's just the approach of catheter ablation that's beneficial. And that's really nice because we know that the launch of of, of Ferropulse and other PFA technologies um, is something that we don't want it to lag too much from the guidelines and it has shown relative equivalence. I also think just to count, point out the asymptomatic state, that's always been a challenge for so many clinicians, but here saying that it may be reasonable, probably given some of the East AF data reduction of stroke, um, really important for the consensus. So Dr. Jays, maybe you can take us home with this beautiful, beautiful 10 key highlights and, and high level uh, from this consensus statement. Yes, uh, happy to do so. So there are practically six key areas that we should focus, indications, pre-procedural management, procedural management, surgical ablation, outcome assessment, and post-procedural management. So in uh, regards to indications, uh, catheter ablation was, uh, has been upgraded as uh, the first line treatment in patients with recurrent paroxysmal artery fibrillation. In patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, we suggest that it is beneficial with the highest level of clinical advice to perform catheter ablation in patients with uh, artery fibrillation and impaired left ventricular function, which is presumed to be related to arrhythmia-mediated cardiomyopathy, but also it is reasonably selected patients to reduce cardiovascular hospitalizations and to reduce mortality. Regarding pre-procedural management, the thrombus screening may be reasonable even routinely, even in those that have been uh, anticoagulated therapeutically, provided that they are considered to be high risk if they have one of the following risk factors, a high uh, thromboembolic risk based on a CHADVA score three and above, persistent atrial fibrillation, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, cardiac amyloidosis, or rheumatic heart disease. In those patients, we may uh, perform thrombus screening, even if they have been uh, therapeutically anticoagulated for the previous three uh, weeks. So uh, regarding the procedural management, definitely uh, routine ultrasound to gain vascular access during catheter ablation. Regarding the ablation strategies, unfortunately, not uh, many changes. PVI remembers, remains a cornerstone. We don't have consistent evidence to support a specific adjunctive strategy beyond PVI that confers additional benefit uh, in relation to PVI only in patients so with persistent atrial fibrillation. Regarding the surgical ablation, Always LAA exclusion during all surgical AF ablation, whether it's concomitant, whether it's a hybrid, uh, we should uh, exclude the left atrial appendage. We have strong data supporting uh, this uh, clinical advice. And uh, in patients undergoing concomitant AF surgery, LA open AF surgery, uh, ideally a biatrial cox maze or a minimum of PVI plus posterior wall isolation. Regarding the outcome assessment, I would think one of the major changes is that we strongly suggest to reduce the duration of the blanking period from three months to eight weeks, and we can uh, discuss further on that. Regarding the AF recurrence endpoint, we had uh, a strong discussion on that, difficulties to reach consensus, but we suggest to maintain the current practice and to report the 30-second threshold data despite the associated uh, caveats and, uh, and uh, weaknesses, and we strongly suggest to report AF burden as an uh, efficacy endpoint during catheter ablation. For the post-procedural management, we suggest uh, post-ablation treatment with uh, therapeutic anticoagulation, depending on the stroke risk of each patient to be tailored on the thromboembolic risk of our patients after the two months, 
And in the early period, as it used to be, no change, therapeutic anticoagulation for all our patients. And also a same day discharge is reasonable in selected patients to reduce healthcare utilization. I think these are the 10 key messages from this consensus statement. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for the visual summary. And I think our readers are going to enjoy it. Um, I think that it's a really clean statement to say there's no consistent evidence in favoring any adjunctive strategy with PVI. I applaud you for it. It's scientifically exactly, unfortunately, after 25 years of searching, we still are looking for that PVI plus. Um, and I would, and I must admit that us institutionally, we still do three months of anticoagulation. So I think this should certainly move the needle with an extra statement like this. You know, one question I have for the group is, is there any with in terms of outpatient monitoring, is it a one week monitor? Is it a 48 monitor or a Holter monitor? Is there any specific guidance with regard to the type of monitoring if it's not an ILR or duration? Yeah, I can mention it. Stelios can back me up also. We did have discussions about this and I think the best data was from Jason Andrade's um, circuit dose study where they had continuous ILRs and the, the, the external intermittent monitoring that got closest to that I think was was four weeks over the year after. So I think we recommended some combination of a week every three months, for example, um, four total weeks over the year that was close, most closest approximated the outcome of a continuous monitoring. Is that right, Stelios? Sir? Yes, and of course it depends whether we discuss it's, it's a clinical trial setting or a routine care, because if it's in the routine care, it doesn't really need, you don't really need to have a very, rigorous monitoring because it does not affect your clinical decision making unless you are thinking considering of discontinuing anticoagulation or the patient has uh, uh, impaired uh, systolic function but in the clinical trial setting the long term uh, uh, monitoring uh, is ideal continuous continuous monitoring is the ideal strategy and the best the best alternative is what Ed discussed based on the analysis of uh, uh, Jason Andrade from the circa dose trial is uh, four weeks of uh, cumulative intermittent using uh, one or two week prolonged monitoring, but a total cumulative uh, intermittent monitoring of four week duration. This is the best alternative to the continuous monitoring. Well, Dr. Jays, Dr. Juan, Dr. Gerstenfeld, thank you so much for all the tireless effort and the work that goes into creating such a masterpiece. It's been seven years in the making and we've been waiting for this update. So we've got it now. I think our readers and our viewership and our society definitely appreciates uh, this really incredible expert consensus document. And thank you for joining us on Heart Rhythm TV. Thank you so much. And I also want to acknowledge Stelios and the huge amount of work he put into this document.